Good evening. This is Alan the Friesen, Alan at the .com. I'm going to be going over tonight how to analyze a poem. The poem that we're going to be looking at in this analysis is called The Universe, original motion picture soundtrack by Tracy K. Smith. Now what you see on your screen here are two versions of the same poem. What I did before I did anything else was I copied out the poem onto a sheet of paper. The reason that I do that is because I tend to read very quickly. And when I just scan something very quickly, often I miss little pieces of what I'm looking at. And so I find it helpful that in order to slow down, to copy out what I'm looking at. Now, this works best for, obviously, poems, not so much for short stories or for novels. But even in short stories or novels, it is helpful to copy out, for instance, a key passage or maybe the introductory paragraph or whatnot. It helps you to slow down and to, um, to organize your thoughts a little bit better. So once I've done that, what I do is I read the entire poem out loud. Now, this is important, particularly for this poem. Uh, what I did actually in the preparation for this recording session here was I... Uh, I started with the analysis over here, but then I found that I missed something. And so let me read the poem, and I'll show you what I missed once I, and I'll explain that once I'm done reading. You're going to have to bear with me. I've got a bit of a cold tonight, but as they say, the show must go on. The Universe, original motion picture soundtrack, Tracy K. Smith. The first track still almost swings. Hi-hat and snare, even a few bars of sax, the stratosphere will singe out soon enough. Synthesized strings. Then something like a cellophane breaking in as if snagged to a shoe, crinkle and drag. White noise, black noise. What must be voices bob up, then drop, like metal shavings and molasses. So much for us. So much for the flags we bored into planets dry as chalk, for the tin cans we filled with fire and rode like cowboys into all we tried to tame. Listen. The dark we've only ever imagined now audible, thrumming, marbled with static like grisly meat. A chorus of engines churns. Silence taunts, a dare. Everything that disappears disappears as if returning somewhere. Now, as I said, it wasn't until I read the poem out loud that I noticed the rhyming here. Dare and somewhere. If you just read the poem on paper, you miss out on those nuances. Poems are meant to be read. I don't care what anybody else tells you. Poems are meant to be read out loud. So then, let's say that I wanted to figure out what was going on in this poem. The best way to do that is by having a pen in hand and by marking up the poem as you go through it a few times. What I did, first of all, is I noted up here that the title itself gives a big hint about the content of the poem. I love the title, The Universe, Original Motion Picture Soundtrack. It sounds as if it's the soundtrack for an actual movie. But of course, there is no movie called The Universe. So we know something interesting is going on here. So as I noted here, the imagery that we're going to see in this poem is related to music and to sound. And in fact, that's exactly what we've got. So what I did was, first of all, I went through the poem and I decided, okay, this poem needs to be broken down into sections. How can we split apart this poem so that we can analyze each section? And once we've done that, put it all together to make sense of the whole. Now, some people will say, well, just look at it in terms of stanzas. But that's not good enough. I mean, look at here. White noise, comma, black noise. If you separate those two obviously connected sections, you're doing a disservice to the structure of the poem. So you need to go more in-depth than just, here's section number one, here's section number two, here's section number three. So the first section that I looked at was the first track. Okay, so the first track still almost swings. So this first stanza is about the first track, quote-unquote, air quotes. Notice all the sibilants here, all the S sounds. We'll get to that in a second. This line here in the second stanza, synthesized strings. I'm not sure what to do with that. You notice here on the bottom here, I put a question mark. I'm still not exactly sure what that means. And that's okay. I mean, when, we, when you study a poem, we don't always have to have all the answers. Sometimes there's going to be things that confuse us, that don't make sense to us. 
Maybe I'll come back to this poem in 10 years and think, oh, okay, well, you know, I didn't know what it meant then, but I know what it means now. And that's okay. So for now, I've left that blank, question mark. In fact, if you look here, you'll notice quite a bit of question marks. But anyway, so third section. I know that this is the third section because we've got then. Then is a transition word, moving from this here to this here. Then something like cellophane breaking in as if snagged to a shoe, crinkle and drag. Now, when I did this, uh, when I broke down the structure of this poem for the first time, I originally put crinkle and drag into its own section, but then I realized the crinkle is referring to the cellophane, and then the drag is referring to what cellophane would uh, sound like if it's snagged to a shoe. So I realized, oh, okay, well, this is actually all one section. So in other words, go back and look at what you've decided in the first place. And perhaps what you did in the first place was wrong or could be could be split up quite a bit better. So that's the third section. This fourth one, white noise, black noise. Now, I've put that into its own section as well. I'm, I'm wondering if this is perhaps part of this section here. Does the white and black noise have something to do with the cellophane and the snag on the shoe? I'm not sure. Notice I've got a, a question mark here and I put contrasting types of static. I know what white noise is, but as I put here, I don't know what black noise is. And then five. This is the longest section that I've got. What must be voices bob up, then drop, like metal shavings and molasses. So much for us. So much for the flags we board into planets dry as chalk. For the tin cans we filled with fire and rode like cowboys into all we tried to tame. This is the rise and fall of humanity in the soundtrack of the universe. I put this all into one section because this refers to humanity. You might go through this and decide, okay, well, maybe the so much for us section all the way up to the end of, of this uh, stanza here, maybe that should be all one section as well. Maybe. But I decided that we should put all of these together because this is all related to humanity. And then we've got two final sections. So first of all, we have the dark we've only ever imagined now audible, thrumming, marbled with static like grisly meat. So we actually have noise here. The temptation is to put these two sections, these two uh, stanzas and this little word as part of this stanza together. But this is different from this. Here we have noise. And here we have silence taunting. We have no noise. Therefore, these sections must be separate. So now what I've done, now that I've got this poem divided into sections, that's when we can start breaking down and understanding what's happening in each of these sections. Now, as I said, this is a far better way to analyze a poem than going through it stanza by stanza or line by line. Look at the thoughts. And essentially, when I say, you know, this is one section, what I mean is that this is one thought. This is one idea put together. So we have the first track. It swings. There's a hi-hat and a snare. There's the bars of sax. I mean, this is referring to swing music. I mean, it's up to beat. It's very, uh, it's very punchy. It's, it's very energetic. And we're thinking about the first track of the universe, then, in my opinion, the first thing we think of is the Big Bang. So we've got nothing, and then all of a sudden, we've got this huge explosion. And that's exactly what swing music sounds to me. It's an explosion of music, an explosion of, of dancing, of laughter, of, of sounds. So that's what this section is referring to here. As I said before, the synthesized strings... It, it's possible that this is part of the first section here. And in fact, now that I'm going through this again and thinking about it, I'm thinking, yeah, this is probably related because in, in um, swing music, you do, have, um, you do have cellos, you do have, good, I want to say guitars. I don't know that much about music, sorry. What I know is from movies, but don't tell anyone. So then, not sure about this, so to skip it and go on to number three then something like cellophane and this here again i'm not sure what this image means cellophane this is the crinkly stuff that flowers are wrapped up in breaking in as if snagged to a shoe so imagine a shoe 
that's dragging this very crinkly paper around. I mean, it's a it's a very harsh sound compared to the swinging music, the, the energetic music of the first bit. This sounds to me almost like continents being formed, you know, like uh, like earthquakes or mountains pushing their way up. This says to me the creation of the, uh, the, so the formation of the solar system or the formation of the earth. And then we have this section, white noise, black noise. And again, I'm not exactly sure what this means. White noise is a type of static. If you take an old radio and you tune it to a dead station and you listen to it, that static is what we refer to as white noise. We also refer to anything that's that's background noise that helps us to uh, helps us to I don't know be distracted from from sharp noises outside. Like uh, an example of white noise would be if you were if you okay if you were raised in New York City, for instance, and you're used to the the sounds of traffic and honking and and sirens throughout the night. And then you moved all of a sudden to the country, out in Iowa, and there's no sounds like that. If you were to take a recording of New York City at night and play that in your bedroom in Iowa as you sleep, that would be considered white noise. But as for black noise, I'm not exactly sure what that is, except that we've got this contrast between the two. White and black are obviously opposites. The repetition here, the, the structural pattern here. What does it mean? I don't know. And that's okay. It's a little frustrating to me as a reader, but that's okay. Then we move on to the section that is probably the most meaningful to me as a reader, not just because I really understand it, but it also because it relates to humanity. And hey, I'm a human. We're all human. All of you who are listening are hopefully human. So the voices bob up, then drop like metal shavings in molasses. What an image. So first of all, we have the voices bobbing up and then dropping quickly. If we're thinking about the scale of this poem, the very beginning of the universe, all the way to the very end of the universe, and humanity going in one little line here, voices bobbing up, then dropping. I mean, we're talking about four words out of the entire poem. The whole, whole course of human history is microscopic on the scale of, um, of the universe in terms of its age. And I think that's one of the points that this poem is getting towards, but I'll get back to that in a second. This image here, metal shavings in molasses. So I made a note here that our voices are the metal shavings, and then the molasses are, is the sudden silence. Now think about metal shavings. Think about how they're shiny, how they're sharp, how they result of, from metal cutting you know, sparks. That's us. That's humans. And then if you drop those into molasses, it's a sudden silence. They fall in and then they just slowly drop to the bottom of the molasses. No sound, nothing left. It's not like an echo, right? That's another type of sound. Or it's not like, um, like bouncing, like it bounces once. No, the molasses indicate just a total absence of sound. The voices go up and then they're just abruptly gone into a darkness, into a, a, a soundlessness that's quite profound. It's a, it's a very powerful image. Notice how the next part of this section reinforces this. There's so much for us, so much for the flags we board in the planet's dry as chalk, for the tin cans we filled with fire and rode like cowboys into all we tried to tame. So notice the words here, tin cans, cowboys, planets dry as chalk. This is all sounding very much like the Wild West, like the frontiersman spirit. But at the same time, it's talking about what's going to happen in the future. We have not been to other planets, certainly not planets with plural S. We have not uh, board pl flags onto any other planets. Into the moon, yes, but that's not a planet. So this is the future, and it's using language of the past to imply that. This is sort of a, I don't know what you'd call it, future nostalgia, perhaps. It's as if this poem was written at the end of the universe, or that's where it's set, and it's remembering back to when humans existed. 
And then we've got the second to last section, the penultimate section, the dark we've only ever imagined, now audible, thrumming, marbled with static like grisly meat, a chorus of engines, churns. This is very chaotic imagery. The dark being audible, the dark thrumming, marbled with static like gristly meat. I mean, we think of a steak and we think about the fat that's running through it. That's the marbling effect, right? So the dark and we've got static and then we've got the chorus of engines churning. It's, it's a very powerful and dark sort of silence, static, but also the noise, the chorus of engines churning. And then finally, we have the silence. Now, at the very end of this poem, it ends, as I say, with a rhyme. And here I put a pseudo couplet. Uh, a lot of sonnets end with, uh, with a rhyming couplet, right? An iambic pentameter. This isn't a sonnet. It's not actually ending in an official couplet. But it sounds like it, right? Silence taunts a dare. Everything that disappears disappears as if returning somewhere. It sounds vaguely Shakespearean. In contrast to section six, section seven is about silence. And I've got this, this line here. Uh, what does it mean for silence to taunt, to dare? Whom is the silence taunting? And this idea of returning somewhere, this idea of returning somewhere, uh, we've, uh, the notes that I've got here is, first of all, you know, this is the very end. And there is this scientific concept of the big crunch. So at the end of the universe, everything is going to crunch together into a little bit, little big, little ball, and then it's going to explode again into a big bang. That's perhaps what this ending is alluding to. It also might be alluding to some sort of spiritual rebirth. So the afterlife or reincarnation. There's nothing throughout the rest of the poem however, that indicates this, the spirituality. So, in my opinion, uh, th this little sign here means therefore. Therefore, uh, this returning somewhere, it, it must be scientific. Even without religion, there's still hope. So, we've got these seven sections, and we sort of understand what these seven sections mean, or most of them, you know, two and three notwithstanding. So then we got to think about, well, if we put this together, what does this poem mean? What is the point of this poem? What are we supposed to get out of this? And in my opinion, the point of this poem comes in the fifth, fifth line. Fifth line. What must be voices bob up, then drop. So this is us. This is humans. And Smith even says, you know, so much for us. So much for the flags we bored into planets dry as chalk. It's as if the poem is saying, we think of ourselves as incredibly important, as if we're the center of the universe. But in terms of the universe, from the universe's perspective, we're nothing. We live and we die. It's the poem is saying that our entire species will die and it won't even register on the, uh, on the uh, for lack of a better term, on the, con the consciousness of the universe. When we die, the universe will keep on going on as if nothing has changed. And at the bottom here, I put, you know, this is this is sort of my interpretation, I suppose, of the poem. We are not the central point of the universe. And I put here below it, nihilist. Now, I'm not saying that Smith is nihilist. I'm not saying the poem is nihilist. But it's it certainly has this nihilistic sort of uh, flavor to it, I suppose we'll call it. Nihilism states that the universe is pointless. Our lives are pointless. Our lives are only what we make of it. There is no grand scheme behind it. There is no God. There's nothing except what we make of it. Far from being hopeless, I mean, this, this perspective implies that we need to go out there and forge our own destinies. We need to make our own lives count for something. Once we're dead, we're dead. But for now, we need to make this world what it is for ourselves and for the people around us. And this tends to have, you know, the people who view this, this uh, philosophy, it, it tends to be fairly, fairly dark, fairly depressing, right? I mean, if, if there's no grand plan for our lives, well, then what should we keep on going? And I, I could get into philosophy. I could get into Kierkegaard. I could get into Camus and, and talk about 
you know, nihilism and existentialism and all that. But I think that's a little bit beyond the scope of what we're doing here. If you're interested in that, nihilism, existentialism, Soren Kierkegaard, Albert Camus, look up these names, look up these people and, you know, do it, do some research. So then, the original point of this video was to analyze this poem. In this poem, we've got amazing pieces of imagery. We, you know, the cellophane, breaking in as if snagged to a shoe, tr crinkle and drag. We've got the imagery of the, uh, of the swing band at the very start of the universe. We've got the imagery of the metal shavings dropping into molasses. We've got the imagery of humans climbing into tin cans that are filled with fire and riding, into cow ri riding like cowboys into all we tried to tame. We tried to tame the universe, and we failed. We're dead. And then we've got the universe afterwards falling into silence, but everything that disappears disappearing as if returning somewhere. So this idea of hope without religion, without spirituality, but this hope that somehow everything is returning somewhere. This idea of return. So, and as I said, that in my opinion, the central point of the poem is, you know, we are not the central point of the universe. It's not all about us. Once we're dead, the universe is going to keep on going. Now, one of the reasons I'm recording this is to help out my 20-1 students as they begin to present their poems to the class. They were each assigned a poem, and they were asked to analyze it, and then they were asked to share with the class their interpretation of what it meant. Certainly, my wonderful students could go through their poems and could explain it like this the entire way through. That should definitely be a, a fairly significant part of their assignment. But for everybody else, I mean, this is this is what I do as a teacher, as a reader, as a scholar. This is what I do when I approach something that I'm familiar, unfamiliar with. I've read this poem before, but this tonight was the first time I've actually gone and analyzed it. So that's the process of analyzing a poem. So in order in summing up, what I do is, first of all, I write out the entire poem by hand. Second of all, I divide the poem into sections. And I look at, you know, try to figure out what words, what phrases go with what phrases. Third, I go through each stanza and try to figure out what's going on. I'm sorry, I go through each section and try to figure out what's going on. Then fourth, we had fourth, one, two, three, four, not so good at math. Number four, what I try to do is see how these pieces fit together. So I've, I've looked at this. I mean, if you think of each of these sections as one track on the soundtrack with, you know, seven, six or seven tracks. See how they fit together. And then five, what does the poem mean? Now that we understand it, now, we under now that we understand how these pieces fit together, what is the point? So what? Like, why did she write this poem? Why do we care? I say she, but I, I'm not exactly sure that Tracy K. Smith is a woman. I should probably find that out. Like Maria Ehrlich. Anyway, I'm getting off topic. Very much off topic. So then, if you're analyzing a poem, these are the steps that I would highly suggest that you go through. Now, as I say, there's there's other things here on this page that I didn't go over, right? I didn't talk about climax or denouement. I didn't talk about the sibilance. Uh, I didn't talk so much about, about the rhyme here and how that has a huge structural impact on the poem. I didn't talk about how, you know, that could, you know, that evokes the idea of a Shakespearean sonnet. I didn't go into that. In the analysis of a poem, you're trying to find out what the poem means. You're trying to find out how the pieces work together. So hopefully throughout this process, this has helped you. Hopefully it'll have, it's, it's helped you understand this poem, but it also gives you the tools in order to analyze other poems in the future. Thanks very much. This has been Alan the Friesen, alanatthefriesen.com. See you later.